Okay. All right, guys. Hello. I'm just waiting for a few more of you to connect. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we're also live broadcasting this webinar onto YouTube. If um, anyone needs to go onto the YouTube page of Avalon, they'll be able to watch us live. Welcome, okay. welcome. All right, guys. Ooh. Hello. I'm just waiting for a few more of you. <laughs> the slight delay is the YouTube, as you can see. Okay. Hi, everyone. I've got Tessa, who's come on as well from, from the Bumblebee Conservation. Hi, Tessa. Hi, Caitlin. Hannah. Anastasia. Hello. Okay. All right, well, everybody, welcome. And first of all, a very happy World Bee Day. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Stephanie Jordan. I am the co-founder of Avalon and also the founder of Drinking Out Loud, um, a specialist marketing consultancy serving the global wine and drinks industry. More importantly, today I will be your host. So firstly, let me thank you all on behalf of Avalon and our other speakers um, for connecting to this live webinar called Banking on Biodiversity. This is actually our second installment of our recently launched Positively Charged, a series offering curated and co-created wisdom with a single aim to light up the sustainability conversation in the drinks industry using a balanced blend of expertise, uh, creativity, and most importantly, positivity. For those of you that don't know Avalon, we are a planet positive, delicious, natural apple spirits brand with uh, environmental positivity at our very core and a mission to be positive in everything that we do. So this webinar is just one expression of that. So today, is indeed World Bee Day. And the United Nations des designated the 20th of May to raise awareness on the importance of bees, or as we like to call them at Avalon, the fuzzy little winged warriors. Now bees, unfortunately, are under continuous threat from human activity, which includes the use of harmful pesticides, modern agricultural practices and urbanization. World Bee Day, exist to educate people on the importance of bees and what they actually do for the environment. Now, this day is actually open to other pollinators, such as the hummingbirds and the butterflies, as together these essential animals help keep ecosystems healthy and maintain biodiversity. Now, by biodiversity, we mean the existence of a wide variety of plants and animals that are living together in their natural environments. Ultimately, biodiversity is the volume of life on Earth, um, as well as all the different species that interact with each other and the physical world around them. And it's important, very, very important. Um, wildlife support healthy ecosystems that we actually rely on um, and nature ultimately can provide more than 30% of the solution that we need currently to combat climate change. And biodiversity is an essential part of this picture. Biodiversity is also good for the economy with at least 40% of the world's economy derived from biological resource. And needless to say, biodiversity is an integral part of people's cultures and identities. So, Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our fabulous lineup of speakers today and kick off this live webinar. Our first speaker will be the fabulous Jill Perkins, the CEO of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Now, Jill has been an enthusiastic conservationist from a young age, and after a career in business, she eventually found her way back to conservation. Now, as CEO of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, Jill has found the perfect channel through which to promote her passion for bumblebees and their protection. At Avalon, we actually donate 50 cents of every bottle sold in the UK 
um, to the Bumblebee Trust. Um, and for the sake of today's webinar, Jill is most definitely the Queen Bee. Next up, we will be hearing from James Chase, uh, also known as the Chief Potato Peeler. James is the director at Chase Distillery, a family founded business with a mission to champion field to bottle spirits, uh, promoting the importance of the farmer and the humble potato. Chase Distillery was founded in 2008, wanting to challenge the status quo and to pioneer a new way of thinking. Today, James is very passionate about encouraging biodiversity behind the back bar. Next up, we will hear from Merlin Griffith, celebrity TV bartender and owner of the Monsters Country Inn. Now, magical Merlin, as he is best known, is ultimately the most charismatic TV bartender on the telly. Uh, in a prior life, he was a global brand ambassador for Bombay Sapphire Gin. And when he is not making delicious drinks for singles looking for love, he is running his local country pub. Uh, Avalon actually recently planted over 200 perennial plants uh, in Merlin's pub garden as part of our pledge of planting flowering plants for the bees between 2019 and 2021. And next up is the one and only Tim Etherington Judge, co-founder of Avalon and founder of Healthy Hospo, a platform for a happier, healthier hospitality industry and all round health and wellness guru, eco warrior, or as I like to call him, my number one worker bee. Uh, Tim was so adamant when we were creating Avalon that he wanted us to really try and be the world's most planet positive spirit. And the bee was very much at the heart of that. He is currently live from Dawson's Curve Garden in East London doing his bit for the bees today. And then lastly, we were supposed to have um, fantastic Freddie, uh, CEO of Lowlander. Uh, Freddie has literally just kind of given birth to a baby daughter, well, his wife has in any case, Mia. So big love to them from us and we're sure to, to bring him on for one of our next Positively Charged series. So the agenda for the next roughly 90 minutes will be as follows. Um, let me just get that up on the screen for you. Ba -ba -bam. There you go. So my piece is done. And next up will be Jill. Um, just so you know, the sort of way of working of this webinar, um, our various panelists will go through their, their kind of 10 minute talks. Up for discussion will be the plight of the bees, sustainable farming practices that support biodiversity. We'll be looking at um, local food and drink and why apples are a great choice for making spirits, amongst other things. And then we will be sending live polling questions during the various speakers talk. So please do interact with them so that we can then immediately publish the results. And once all the panelists have spoken, we'll be opening up for a Q&A using the Q&A button, bottom, uh, button at the bottom of your screens. Now, in the meantime, in the chat, if you do have questions and thoughts that you want to be sharing direct, directly with each panelist, please do feel free to do that. I can happily um, feed sort of questions as we go. And just so you know, before we, we go live uh, with the speakers, we are gifting you all, all of those that you're attending live, a free Avalon, um, do you have one, Tim? This is an Avalon bee bomb. It's a, a biodegradable hand grenade filled with wildflower seeds. Um, so we'll be sending a link on the chat and a promo code, which will be positive. Um, so all of you can receive one of these and do your bits for the bees. So without further ado, uh, Jill, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. This is the most exciting day of the year. It's even better than Christmas, isn't it, World Bee Day? And thank you for letting me talk bees, something I'm not allowed to do at home anymore. My partner, Steve, years ago said if we managed to go out to the pub or the cafe, meet friends, and no one mentioned bees, he would donate £100 to the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. He still hasn't had to. And sadly, he insisted we put all bets off on hold during lockdown when we don't meet our friends and et cetera at cafes. So anyway, bees. Shall we start with apples? Would you like to start with apples? Yeah. So wonderful fruit and the bees you must particularly love for producing this versatile fruit are our solitary bees. Over 230 species in the UK, they have lovely hairy abdomens, which means when they land on the blossom, the pollen sticks to their hairs, they hop onto the next flower and voila, 
pollination. But a quick word about pollination because you can't talk bees without mentioning it. So pollination is crucial to our health, human beings health, and the survival of a myriad of different creatures who rely on seeds and fruits produced by pollination. And of course, our global food security. It's estimated, some lovely folk at Reading University, that pollination in this country is worth 691 million pounds. And insect pollination are essential for our food production. They improve our yield and quality of three quarters of all the crops grown in the UK. Across the EU, insect pollination is estimated to contribute 4.2 billion euros annually to the EU economy. So if bumblebees and other insect pollinators declines continue, the extremely high cost of pollinating these plants by other means could significantly increase the cost of fruit and vegetables. So if we were to go into a supermarket and buy our apple, and today that apple might be 20 pence, without our wonderful insect pollinators doing the work that they do for free, it might cost us one pound 20 pence. And apparently some other really fantastic scientists worked out that hand pollinating British crops has been estimated at 1.8 billion annually. So again, if we lost all this free work that our pollinators are doing, and particularly our bees as the major pollinators, then we would be in real trouble. So it's not just apples, is it? It's strawberries, raspberries, cherries, beans, oilseed rape, tomatoes. Ooh, let's talk about tomatoes because tomatoes are really, really interesting in relation to bumblebees in particular. So some flower species have evolved to be very, very conservative with their pollen, which is a very clever evolutionary strategy. So pollen is really costly for the plant to produce in terms of energy. So the plant wants to make sure that the pollen produced is transported effectively in order for it to be able to reproduce. Plants that have evolved this strategy have very long thin anthers and those are the yellow things in the middle of the flowers that you normally see. Which means that the pollen is packed really tightly into that anther, that part of the plant that holds the pollen. So most insects are unable to access this pollen. However, bumblebees, really clever creatures, are able to contract their flight muscles, which are in their thorax, which produces really strong vibrations. And it's been measured that the bumblebee vibrates at exactly 400 hertz. And they bite onto the anther and they cling onto the flower. And that vibration opens up the pollen, resulting in this bee covering explosion of nutritious pollen grains from the tip of the anther. Now, the bumblebee will comb most of those pollen into her pollen sacs on her hind legs, but a few lucky grains will be missed and they'll go on to fertilize one of the next flowers she visits. So that whole process is called buzz pollination and only bumblebees can buzz pollinate. So if you think of things like blueberries, aubergines, kiwis, potatoes, all need this sort of pollinations and only bumblebees, no other insect, honeybees can't do it, solitary bees can't do it, only bumblebees. And, and not a lot of people know that we actually import 70,000 boxes of commercially farmed bumblebees every year in this country to furnish our tomato industry and our soft fruit industry. So 100% of the tomatoes that you buy at the supermarket will have been come from somebody that has imported bumblebees in order to pollinate them. And if you've ever been to the glass houses at Thanet Earth in Kent, uh, thousands of acres, millions and millions of bumblebees are used to, to pollinate that. It's a, it's a global industry. That's so amazing. That's an amazing uh, number of bees that we import. I know. No, nobody knows, you know, and even the pick your own uh, places that grow strawberries and raspberries, they, they use imported bumblebees as well. It's a, it's a fun, hugely global industry and not many people realise uh, how important they are. So bumblebees, because bumblebees are the best bees, as far as I can know, you can see a little chart behind me. We've got 24 species of bumblebees in the UK and half of those species, so 12 of those species, are struggling to survive. We've already lost two to extinction in the last century. There's a very few reasons why they're declining, but mostly it's due to changes in their habitats. So after the Second World War, we lost 97% of our wildflower meadows. 
uh, and everything went down for food, which was rightly so. We were all hungry, we couldn't import it. Uh, in the 1990s, um, the agricultural intensification, we have a growing population, we needed to grow more food. Uh, we started using more pesticides and insecticides and in, in the 1990s, we got neonicotinoids, which is a systemic insecticide. Uh, and that's a very emotive subject, but I always used to call that bayoneting the wound. The wound was made when we lost the habitat. Uh, everything else, climate change, insecticide, even the pests and diseases these imported bees bring in, they all pay their role in uh, uh, the decline in bumblebees. So bumblebees, for me, obviously, really lovely, charismatic, charming creatures, and they need our help to reverse their declines. And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how are the bees doing, Jill? Well, luckily, or perhaps not luckily, it's all quite well planned, we have some really fabulous supporters and members at the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, all working hard to reverse the decline in bumblebees. Uh, and so these bee walkers, they're volunteers, they're citizen scientists, they help me to answer that question because they all walk one to two kilometre transect once a month, record the bumblebees they see and the flowers they're feeding on. This data is collected. I have some very clever scientists in the trust. They look at all that data and it's transformed into our bee walk annual report which is a really comprehensive scientific document with up-to-date information on how our bumblebees are doing. Uh, and if you're interested in A, becoming a bee walker or B, having a look at the report, which is re really interested even to a non-scientist like me, then go on our website, which is www.bumblebeeconservation.org. Do you want to launch the poll, somebody? Yes. Let's... Before I do that, I just have two questions in from the audience. Okay. Um, one was around, you were saying how critical, obviously, um, they are to the economy. But the question is the fact that actually, are they not crucial for human survival and therefore the cost is much, much greater? Yes, that, that's crucial to human survival. That, there's that uh, mythical, apocryphal quote about, you know, if all the bees die, we die too. Not absolutely true. Uh, we would have a much poorer diet because quite a lot of plants can be wind pollinated. So we would still have our bread. Our, our diet would look very brown. We wouldn't have the colorful fruits. I always think uh, the bees aren't there to work, to do stuff for us humans. I have, think they have an intrinsic value of their own. Uh, and I think that's why they're so precious. We mustn't, I don't think we should think about the creatures that do good stuff for us as because we're human beings and they should do good stuff for us. I think we should value them for their own sake. Fabulous. And um, I think this is a bit of a trivial pursuit question. How oh, no. much does a bumblebee cost? Sorry? How much does a bumblebee cost? Gosh, well, it, relative to what? <laughs> <laughs> as, as you're saying, people import them in by the thousands. I suppose the question is, what would be the cost of one? It, on, on oh, my goodness. Well, um, as far as I know, um, a box of bumblebees uh, that you can, uh, that the, the, the big commercials import probably costs in the region of £36. I think within that box, there will be a nest of bumblebees of probably about 40 to 50 starter bumblebees. So... There we are, 36 divided by 50, or 36 divided by 100. Let's say there's 100 bees in there. £3.50. 36 pence. <laughs> so we can basically save more than one. Well, we, we, can, we can purchase back one bee per bottle of Avalon. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll launch your poll. I'll let you um, ask the question. It's gone okay. live now. So what's the biggest threat to bumblebee populations in the UK? Loss of habitat, insecticides, or climate change? Okay, people are answering halfway through. Almost there. Got 10 more people that need to answer. See, some people are thinking about it. It's actually not an obvious answer. No, but that's why I said biggest. That's the clue. That's, that is the clue. Okay. I'm going to end the poll now. In three, two, and one. 
Okay, and I'm sharing the results. Yay! Loss of habitat is the biggest threat. Insecticides and climate change are also threats as well, but it's the loss of habitat that is the main one. Fantastic. Shall I go on with my? Yes, please. Okay. So we've mentioned solitary bees, and if you love Avalon and you love cider in particular, solitary bees are the ones for you, and bumblebees. These are, and both of those types of bees are our wild bees. But there's also the very familiar honeybee. Uh, and these are the three bees that you find in the UK. And to re recap, we've got one honeybee species, Apis mellifera. We have 24 bumblebee species and over 230 solitary bee species in the UK. All of them are important for pollination. Many like bumblebees and tomatoes necessary for pollinating different plants at different times of day in the year. So some of the bees, uh, honeybees have quite short tongues, about two millimetres. Bumblebees of the 24 species, their tongue lengths ranges from two millimetres to 19 millimetres. That's the longest tongue. So what that means, and same with solitary bees, what that means is each bee is capable of pollinating different flowers. So, uh, for example, honeybees would struggle to pollinate something with tubular like comfrey or, or foxglove or something like that. Whereas the open flowers like oilseed rape, really good for, for honeybees. So um, those are the three types of bees, all of them important uh, in the UK. Now I would say bumblebees are the most important because I work for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, but they're a much overlooked wild bee. So a few weeks ago, someone posted on Twitter, how do we save this planet? So. I'm an optimist and during this incredibly challenging time, I don't underestimate how terrible this time has been for a lot of people. I do think we can all feel a little bit optimistic if we can imagine new ways of doing things. And I think we have to find new ways of doing things. And I think the issue generally isn't technology or, or even money. I think it's political will and consumer choice. You know, humanity, all of us have a real good knack at solving the most vexing challenges just in time. And history has shown that many people taking small steps together can achieve miraculous advances. And that is the unsung heroes that ultimately create change. And I think we and all our listeners today are those unsung heroes because I think we can all do something to help bees, all of the bees, whether it's honey, solitary bees or bumblebees. Uh, and certainly for the drinks industry, and I do work closely with some drinks at Avalon and obviously Corny and Barrow, I work closely with as corporate supporters uh, and Ambriel, the vineyard I spoke to, I was talked about earlier. These are all working hard to look at the ways their industry can help bees. So my first thing for helping bees is oddly enough, talk to children because it's the next generation that is gonna be really important to saving, saving them. And, and talk to them about where their food comes from. Uh, and Merlin, when your pub eventually opens, have little posters around there that shows how important pollination is, or even on the menu say, pollinated by bees, or I don't know, just so people uh, and young children really understand how important they, they are. Um, obviously, plant bee friendly flowers in your garden or on or pots on your uh, on your patios on the website on the Bumblebee website. We have this fantastic app uh, or tool called Bee Kind. Over 700 of the best bee friendly flowers you can plant. You can score your garden for bee friendliness. It's all free. Brilliant, brilliant thing to be able to use. You can nag your council to not mow the verges. Don't mow, let it grow. You can become a bee walker, do timed insect counts, details on our website. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter and, and just learn more about these lovely creatures. You can join the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. That's a really important one on World Bee Day. Everybody who's at this webinar can go away and join the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Ask your friends to join, but just, I think just, learn to love all the bees and learn about all the bees we have in this country. They're, they're so important and so beautiful. Uh, and I don't think, you know, I'm not asking you to believe in my ability to create change. 
and I'm asking it for you to make the change. So. Fantastic. Um, I had a second poll from you. Would you like me to launch that one as well? Yes, please. Yes, please. I think that might help um, answer a last question I have here from James Fowler. Um, just in terms of recapping why exactly that loss of habitat. So after the Second World War, uh, it was very difficult to bring food across from other countries. And a lot of our land had was down because uh, agriculture was then mostly by horse and cart and not by mechanization. Um, so it was very, very different world after, after the world. And our population was much lower. But as the population of this country has grown, uh, agricultural agriculture has increased in intensity and mechanization that uh, habitat, those wild flower meadows have been lost to growing other food that we need just as much. We don't blame the farmers at all. The farmers are really, really important to us. And every farmer I've ever met is really genuinely interested in having biodiversity on their farms, but there's a lot of pressures on them to produce enough food for us to eat now. Yeah, I was reading as well about post Second World War and how people are encouraged to grow food at home um, yeah. and up to, and in America in particular up to 60% of the food that was consumed um, after, in the few years after the war was grown uh, in your gardens at home so I think as we've seen a decline of people growing food at home that's put even more pressure on the farmers and the land to produce even more food yeah okay so um your second poll was what is the percentage of wild flower meadows lost in the UK since the 30s um Anyone else want to answer? We have a few few seconds left. All right, I will publish the results. Dun, dun, dun. Yay, it's 98%. I said 97%, but it's 98% is good enough. So, yeah. That's incredibly high. Yeah. Yeah, high. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much, um, Jill. Just before we now move on then to James, um, I do have one more question in from Rufus. Is there enough funding in place for the bee conservation and what's being done that could be, that what's not being done that could be done if there was more funding in place? Do you have a sort of quick answer? Oh, we've got half an hour, would you like to phone me later? <laughs> let's, let's go with that option. Um, you're also welcome to type back in the Q&A box, Jill, if you want to have a think about that. Answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll send him my email address and we can have a chat on email. That's quite a big question to answer. I and I, I'm interested in hearing James's talk. He, he's in finance, but finance for, for the good of the planet. So I would definitely put you both in touch. Okay. Um, okay, fantastic. So moving on. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, I think it's, is it James' turn? Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much, Jill. That was, um, that was really incredibly educational and there's always so many, so many stats that you, uh, you always um, astound us with. So thank you so much for that. And yeah, proud to be here, um, Stephanie and, um, uh, and Tim for, for inviting me onto this uh, panel talk today. And of course, Merlin, who will, uh, who will come on later. Um, I'm currently sat at home, um, close to the farm um, in Herefordshire. So I don't know if many of you guys out there know, where, know where Herefordshire is. It's not Hertfordshire, but it's, um, it's an unknown county, um, right, pretty much right in the middle of the UK. And it's, um, it's really famed for its rich, red, rolling, fertile uh, fields. Um, and it really is a, a kind of a county of agriculture over tech um, and service industry, um, which, which is why I really love it. Um, I, I always remember, I kind of grew up here and after school, I was desperate to get away, but over the last kind of 10 years, I've absolutely loved being, being back here again. And, um, uh, and, and it really is a kind of, we know we talk a lot about biodiversity on, uh, on this panel today, but if you ever, ever get the chance to come up here and you know, I know, know Merlin and, and Tim have kind of been up to the farm and things, but if you ever get a chance to come up and see Herefordshire, um, it really is the, the land that time forgot and probably would be, you know, uh, if, you, if you kind of closed your eyes and, and took yourself back to the Bronze Age, it would be uh, very, very similar. Fortunately, Herefordshire now has Wi-Fi and we're, we're connected with the wider world, which is, uh, which is great. But, um, you know, it is just incredible. And, you know, as I look out my window here, um, I see all these hedgerows, um, you know, and if you look back at back to the Bronze Age, hedgerows were were inputted into into the UK to form parishes and to, to define farmers' fields. And 
um, if you want a, an ecosystem that is, you know, is a plenty of, of mix of wildlife and, and plants that are living in their natural habitat, then, then hedgerows really do typify this. Um, so I am a, uh, yeah, kind of a, a, a spirit um, guy and um, we, our family have been distilling actually quite a short amount of time. We started in 2008 um, with, a, with a kind of real big mission just to, you know, champion field to bottle spirits and almost to put the farmer back at the forefront of the conversation. Um, if you look at anything that you consume in life from your clothing to your to your, your most favorite food um, from your supermarket, you know, has at some point started with a farmer. Um, and in this fast age of buying as much as we want, as cheap as we want, uh, the farmer is often um, kind of put at the back burner of the conversation. Um, and it's great now, um, I, I appreciate there's a lot of crisis and, um, and trouble going on in the world right now, but I think out of this, the farmer is actually having a bit more of a say and we're, we're realizing that you know, good food shouldn't be made cheap. It should be made at a fair price and it should be made in an environment that, um, that contributes to the, you know, to the ecosystem and to the, to the land. Because we all know that, you know, that, that we're just custodians of this planet. We've got to leave it in a better place than we come from. But without being self-righteous and going on an eco trip, we're here to talk today to talk about the, the humble bee. Um, so our distillery is based in, in Herefordshire. Um, we grow potatoes and that's what my family have been growing for over four generations now and those very potatoes make up uh, the kind of base produce of all of um, you know of all of that we make right from our potato vodka right through to to our gins and we're very interesting as a gin distillery where we don't use a neutral grain spirit we we make everything from scratch um, and that that really is you know it's, it's a lot more hardship but we believe that that is, that is a very sustainable approach. And we, we do love that, you know, the UK now and the world has had a craft spirit revolution. Um, and, and there's some really interesting initiatives that are, that are coming out of that. Um, we always believe that, you know, the smallest changes can have the, the biggest impact. Um, and at the farm, we, you know, we were historically commercial farmers and we were, we were farming on, you know, on quite a big scale. Um, and and my, my dad kind of had an epiphany one day and, you know, realized that, you know, we, we, we need to be honing this back and actually making a brand out of the, you know, the commodity that we were making back then. So we, we started a crisp company in 2001, uh, Tyrrells, which um, you guys might be familiar with. And then 2008 started the distillery to, um, to use up the potatoes that were too small uh, to, make the, to make the crisp from. And that's where Chase Distillery started. Um, but we are really now intensively looking at um, the small practices that we have on the farm in our and our very small ecosystem um, at the distillery. Um, so we are um, and, and speaking to these lovely panelists today um, have really spurred us on to um, to start with our own beehives on the farm um, and to really start kind of getting that ecosystem as you know strong as we as we physically can. Um, we are we are underway with our own hives. Um, uh, a few of you might know that um, uh, honeybees um, take about a year to, um, to, to to kind of produce their honey, but we're well underway in in getting this um, uh, the, these kind of bees to to start kind of going through um, our system, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, um, uh, to to showcase this lovely honey that we've got from our from our farm, and 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 some honeys that you you can try all around the world will will reflect the environment that they've come from. So. Um, I was down in Champagne um, before Christmas and each vineyard made its own honey. And it was amazing the complexities that, that the honey had from, um, from the different locations. So that's really exciting to have. I'll kind of finish with how um, bees um, affect us and our, our systems and our crops on our farm. Um, the potatoes are, are, are quite unique in, in how they're pollinated as such. Um, so one of my favorite restaurants in the world um, is, uh, it was by a fantastic chef called Alice Waters, Chez Panisse in California. Um, and she always had um, a, a great saying, which, which I always um, talk about. Um, and she was kind of at the forefront of this um, kitchen garden movement, you know, sourcing local produce in season that hasn't traveled for miles. And she was reflecting it in her dishes um, that evoked simplicity, but maximum flavor. And she's an absolute, a hero and she's a dream dinner party guest um uh, if ever i was going to come up with one but um yeah she she you know she always said the closer that you are to the source of your food and drink the better it is for us in this environment and i think that's so apt in this day and age of 
of what we're all trying to go against and, and to go on. And, and then, you know, looking back at the, you know, the humble bee that, that it is really kind of so important in, in that integral process of, of producing all those, you know, delicious uh, ingredients that Alice might be using in her restaurant. And I think Jill mentioned earlier that we would, as human beings, have an incredibly bl bland diet if it wasn't for, um, you know, for those lovely bees. Most of our food would be, you know, a particular colour and there wouldn't be the variance and light that we have in it. Um, so, I, so I think it is it's so important. And if you look on a, you know, where, where I'm related to, yes, we make lots of lovely spirits, but those also end up into cocktails. And, and consumers now, we, we love we love drinking with our, our eyes. We love seeing things with our eyes. And, you know, it really is down to those, to those bees again, to enrich, enrich that color and variance into all these different crops and species. Um, staying in California, we also realize how interconnected we are as, um, uh, as, as, as a civilization. Um, and there's this most amazing, um, when I was lucky to travel out there last year, I, um, I ended up seeing quite a few um, redwood trees. And if you, if you ever have a Google one minute, or if you've ever had the good fortune of seeing redwoods in, um, in plantation, um, they're, they're huge, uh, absolute skyscrapers of, uh, of trees. Um, and I was really interested to actually learn that they, they don't have particularly uh, low root structures, um, their, their roots. Because you know, imagine these, these huge trees have, have to have incredible kind of systems to support them, to stop them falling over. Um, and I learned that the, the, the red roots are all interconnected in their, um, in their root systems. And it, and it kind of just shows what we're going through now as a, as a huge crisis, actually how interconnected we all are um, as a civilization. And, and these the small changes that are, you know, from just even recycling to, to giving, giving uh, an insight about, um, you know, about what you're eating and drinking really does have these small effects. Um, so kind of that leads me on to like the main point of why, you know, my little bit and why I wanted to talk about today is um, I have the great fortune to visit many uh, amazing cocktail bars all around the world and, um, and, I, and, and a bartender that really are at the forefront of our, um, of everything that we do. Um, and I'll let Merlin go on to that later. Um, uh, but um, for me, um, I am an absolute ambassador for diversity behind the back bar. Um, if you look at specific bars, um, predominantly the, the main type of base spirit will be made off a grain agricultural crop. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, you know, just as an example for gin, you know, 98% of all, you know, pretty much of all gins on the market will be made from a grain base, which is, which is absolutely fine. And it's, it's a great um, base agricultural product to use. Um, it's highly efficient and it has a different flavor, flavor type. If you ever come over to the Chase uh, household for a dinner party, um, we love getting different vodkas out from different bases, from wheat, from barley, from potato, from grape to rye. Um, th and, and then you taste them side by side and they all have the most amazing different characteristics and grain by, by a lot of distillers from, from whiskies all the way through to, to vodkas gins has been traditionally been made from this grain base because it's highly efficient um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a very effective um, base to, to go from. But if everything was from grain, we, we would have probably quite a bad problem. And, um, you know, luckily enough to on that visit to America last year, I, I was in contact with quite a few different farmers. And, you know, America has another big problem now, which is monoculture. And that's the kind of the, the farming of one crop and, and, and promoting its efficiency and high yields. But what that, that does to biodiversity and diversity within anything is, is real sacrilege. So, um, so for us, we believe that, you know, a great cocktail bar, the little difference that I can do is that every cocktail bar I go to or every kind of shop I go to, I love to see the diversity and different base spirits. So, you know, a good, even a good back bar at home should have Avalan, of course, but it should, <laughs> it should have maybe a tequila, you know, maybe a potato vodka, um, you know, different base spirits. So we are embodying a, uh, an ecosystem that is thriving in its local nature and, you know, for us, potatoes are great because they're, 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 they're the best thing that you can grow in Herefordshire. The soil is really rich and red and fertile. Um, the soil structures are perfect for growing spuds. Um, so that, that, that's a really interesting point for me. And it's one that, you know, I want to keep pushing forward about, about different bases. Because if we all ate the same thing and all, all enjoyed the same thing, um, our, our kind of planet would, would suffer as a huge result of that. Um, Potatoes have been the bane of our lives for many years as farmers. My brother Harry now heads up our farm. Um, they've made us laugh, they've made us cry, but they're, um, if you've ever 
uh, grown potatoes at home, they're, they're a bloody nightmare. Um, they take a lot of work, um, but they really are uh, incredibly tasty um, and, and very, you know, very versatile in lots of different diets. But we, we can only grow potatoes in the ground one in five years. Um, those other four years, we, we need to put other crops back in there to, to, to reset the soil's pH or nutritious value. And that's a really important point that, again, not that monoculture. And, you know, if we were growing potatoes in the ground every single year, we would be really sucking out the life of that soil. Um, and we would be, you know, ruining the, the, the kind of the, even the animals and the, and the plant systems around there because they would all feed off each other interconnected via, via bees and, and, and other things that would help self-pollinate. Um, so at, Her uh, at Herefordshire on the farm, we are increasingly uh, crop rotating and we, we do have a, a structure where we're planting um, different fields with different varieties of, of crops to make sure that we have a balanced um, farming ecosystem. And it's really great. Um, it would have been lovely this year to, to have the distillery open for visitors, but right in front of the distillery, we've now planted a potato field and we haven't been able to do so for the last six years because it's been on that crop rotation. Um, but it was really great to see that, you know, we could we could show the very potatoes in the front of the distillery and then we could we could take them on, on through the journey of being turned into a um, uh, into a delicious bottle of vodka or, or gin. So bees, going back to the bees, they really are kind of incredibly important to us at Chase, but but alongside everything else that we um, uh, that we you know that we have that we have living in the, the ecosystem on the on the chase farm. Um, bit of a question with kind of monocultures and and looking at um, systems there. You know, a big problem in America is um, is corn um, and GMO corn in, in particular. Um, I won't go on a, a big rant about it now, but um, um, but but a lot of um, a lot of plastics and a lot of chemical products and, and a, quite a few alcohols in America can be derived from corn. Um, it is a, such a cheap commodity, but it really is killing huge ecosystems out there. You know, whilst it might be very uh, efficient, it, it will absolutely kill the loss and diversity. And you're seeing these huge Midwestern farms um, are often um, are often damaging their systems. And, and it is increasing now with with the risk of flooding um, and and the and the problems it then faces on for um, uh, for you know for for families where they're living. Um, but at the end of the day, these are farmers and they need to make a living. So it's our, our choice back again as consumers, whether we're doing the right thing and we're, whether we're paying the higher price that we can afford to make those smaller changes all through our, all through our diets, from, from what we're washing our hands with to what chemicals we're using to what, what you know, pesticides you know, we're putting on our farm. We're not organic at Chase. Um, we've always believed in practicing farming credentials that um that that the whole world should be practicing you know if everybody went organic tomorrow you couldn't feed the world's resource so we believe in 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 practicing farming techniques that that will see us through for for many different years and for many different generations um and then and then looking back on the, on the bars again in terms of um in terms of how they can make a difference and how they can keep this cycle up because i talked to a point there about what you can afford well if you can imagine one cocktail bar it's just opened up. It's the life and soul of this individual. How, how is he going to make a living by supporting um, all of these different craft spirits? Because they might be more expensive, like Avalan, like Chase. We don't have the budgets of these big international companies. How can that bartender or how can that operator um, serve, up, serve up these drinks um, and still make his margin? You know, a, a good cocktail bar might be looking at 60%, 65% margin on a, on a cocktail. Um, uh, Merlin has a pub, so he's always trying to hit those hit those margin points on his bar, um, and that's a really interesting question. <laughs> that's a really interesting question. It's um, you know it's an incredibly tough business. Um, you know we are dominated by by really big spirit companies here in the in the UK and the world, and they they can tend to um, you know they can tend to really drive um, specific specific products and specific volume products on on consumers and individuals. Um, and I was reading a really good article the other day of just a few different practices, how smaller operators are looking to, you know, to, to kind of uh, keep that change up. And, um, you know, one, one good bartender had the proposition of, you know, if it's, if it's not a problem, well, we can't change it exactly. So if making up a cocktail, maybe one part was from a, you know, big industrial player that, that was producing a lot of volume. But the, the, the next kind of ingredient in that cocktail might be from a smaller producer like Avalon. 
So whilst it's not 100% as diverse maybe as it could be, you know, they're building up a, you know, kind of a, a difference in their bar program and they can reflect that on the menu. Um, but yeah, it's the ultimate trouble of, of a consumer. You know, we work very hard for our money um, and we want to make it work as hard as possible. And, and often booze is probably, um, you know, not big on a lot of people's priority in terms of spending where you can do. Um, and it's great to see in the UK over the last uh, 10 years that, you know, craft spirits have absolutely mushroomed. Um, but it's going to be interesting now where, you know, where it all goes from, from here. Um, apologies, I probably have probably overrun a little bit. I think I think it was incredibly valid. Um, you know, it's, it's about those sort of tips and, and tricks that we can all be considering from all aspects of the decision making, whether that is a you know, consumer walking into a bar or a bartender, what we stock, what we choose to order. Um, you know, and I think definitely we've seen this kind of purchase behavior behavior in food we just haven't quite seen it trickle down into drink yet um and that's why we talk about pouring with purpose you know and actually uh, the booze brands you do get behind can make a real difference um a to small businesses but b more importantly overall to to the environment and to the planet right and so back bar biodiversity sounds amazing i'm gonna launch your question james which i think is fantastic and also, I expect um, a dinner party invitation. You've mentioned dinner parties like five times. They seem to be. <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah, definitely. Well, it must be something that I'm dreaming of because I haven't, haven't had one in um, a few months now. But um... no, Can I be on the invite list, please? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you can bring your beers with you too. That'd be great. Um, okay, so your poll question is, how many potatoes are in a bottle of Chase vodka? Yeah. This is, a this, is a, this is an average amount, obviously, you know, potatoes through the seasons vary, but on average, we do these data sets and studies of what we use on our three varieties of potatoes, Maris Piper, Lady Clare and King Edward. Um, and, and this is kind of the level that we go to, to, um, to use up in a bottle. So how many potatoes in a bottle of Chase vodka or gin? It'd be exactly the same. I bet if anyone's been in a masterclass with you, they should know this answer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. I've got 75% that have answered. Sharing results, boom, boom, boom. What, are they right? Are they wrong? Uh, yeah, it's 250. So we had a split, but yeah, 250 potatoes go into every uh, go into every bottle of Chase, which is um, which is quite a large amount if you can imagine it. So amazing. Uh, we should create our very own trivial pursuit for drinks brands and <laughs> be a question. But thank you so much for listening and um, yeah, look, looking forward to seeing what um, Merlin and the rest of the guys have to say. Amazing. Thank you, James. Okay, Magical Merlin, over to you in your sunny bee positive garden. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, James. Thank you, Gillian. Um, some really great points so far as well, a, a few of which I think we might touch on. Do let me know, by the way, if it gets a little choppy. I'm having a, a couple of issues in the garden with uh, internet reliability. Um, however, yeah, so where do I come into all of this stuff on, on banking on biodiversity? Um, from where I'm sitting as a, as a business owner, and this is sort of where I'm going to look at things today um, on World Bee Day, happy World Bee Day, by the way, um, is that it's the long tail of sustainability. I think as an industry, we have a real focus largely on gold standard operators um, and, and larger operators. Uh, think, for example, Silo is, is fantastic. You know, the, these guys sort of set the standard in zero waste, sustainable purchasing um, and, and, and biodiverse ecosystems uh, in, in their sort of purchasing decisions. It can all be a bit scary, I think. Um, and, and I think it's been touched upon now already. James mentioned as well. It's little things. And, and you mentioned as well, Stephanie, didn't you? It's, it's small steps because you look at these big pictures and you go, I, I can't do that. I'm a small business owner. What, what on earth do you expect me to do? I, I might recycle a bit of cardboard. Do you know what? That's a good thing. Start there. Start there and then start thinking what you can do next and what you can do next. Um, I, I think, you know, and, and it's I don't, I don't really want to talk about the situation we're in at all and, and focus on it. But however, the one thing for me, the pandemic has highlighted from a business side of things, there is a huge long tail of smaller operators in the UK accounting for a very large percentage of business. And so taking that effect into consideration, I'd argue the case for marginal gains having this cumulative impact um, and enabling lots of small businesses to make an impact through simple initiatives. Um, I mean, you know, these can be really simple contributions. If I look at what I'm doing here as a, as a countryside pub, um, 
the first gimme always is considering food waste, portion size, specific food waste collection, composting where possible. If, you, if you're rural and, and many pubs and small businesses are, composting is great because that then feeds into your gardens, which feeds into your bee populations. Um, challenge your chefs and your bartenders, but your chefs specifically, try maybe a, a limited menu, 30 or 50 mile menu. This is something we're personally gonna now have a look at. Uh, we've had this on the cards for ages. Uh, we're now sort of keying up to it for the next year ahead. But we've got this idea that we want to try and source around 80% of our ingredients from within limited radius. Um, the biggest challenges here, are obviously, you know, discovery of new suppliers. This is, there, there's no yellow pages of small suppliers out there. You, you do have to do a fair bit of legwork, but it's worth it. Um, and, and managing a longer supplier list, I think, is your other big challenge there as a business. Um, but these aren't insurmountable, but they do require a little more work than one-stop purchasing, um, which I'll talk a little more about later, but it's an easy trap to fall into as a business, I think. Um, I've got my one, two, three big wholesalers. I get everything from them. You know, it's, it's simple. It's two, three phone calls, bingo. Next thing, let's move on because business is busy. Um, but no, you, you need to build up this longer list, I think. Um, and, and this is part of what you do as a business to change your behavior first. Then you work with those suppliers to reduce your waste also. Simple things, reusable delivery crates. I, most of the suppliers that I use currently for the kitchen and, and now our, our cellar suppliers, as it were, and my wet suppliers, um, they, they all deliver in reusable crates. So it's taking me two or three minutes longer to receive a delivery because you've got to unpack everything, check it in. But it's, it's, again, it's not such a big hurdle to get over two or three minutes. Hey, it's nice to be friendly to the guys that deliver once in a while rather than great. Yeah, just dump it over there, sign it off and run off. Um, you know, uh, and also where they are delivered in boxes and especially mixed cases. Uh, Tim, as you're probably aware, you know, with Avalon, for instance, you know, you might have two or three bottles of Avalon in an order. That's going in with an order of 50 or 60 mixed bottles for an account. So that's all coming in cardboard boxes, random mixed stuff. Get the guys to take it away with them. There's, there's no point you guys having to do that extra level of recycling at your end. They actually do reuse these things through the warehouses. All of this stuff, again, it feeds into doing the right thing. Um, rural locations, I mentioned, and it sites with any kind of land attached. Do you know what? I, and I was thinking about this deeply earlier. I'm very lucky here, as you can see in the background, I've, I've got a, a, a fairly sizable garden for, for a pub. Um, recently planted as well, courtesy of uh, Avalon and, and the Royal Horticulture Show at the Mulvins, basically, uh, which was obviously cancelled. Um, Tim and Stephanie had, had sponsored uh, one of the gardens there for Violette Sasbo. Um, it would be full of biodiverse plants. Um, obviously, with the show not going ahead, we're, we're very, very, very lucky here to have homed over 200 of them. Um, and this feeds into local biodiversity, which is fantastic. Whereas previously, um, Jillian, you know, yeah, you probably hang your head at my efforts where I tried to do some gardening. I'm a typically poor gardener on the whole, although I've been learning a lot of late. I'd been scattering large bunches of wildflower seed because that was rather cheap and readily available. Used to get sort of, so you can get a kilo, you buy it by the kilo down the local garden center. And I was just sort of scattering that in places as a little thing to try and encourage butterflies and bees and so on in the garden because they're pretty. Um, but this is a whole different ball game now. Um, but thinking about this, it's any kind of space you've got? Have you just even got a little bit of street frontage? Have you even just got a spare window ledge inside your smaller cocktail bar? Um, grow something, absolutely anything, grow something, however simple, um, whether it's just a mint plant or a couple of thyme and basil plants through to a simple herb garden or strawberry patch. All of this feeds into the biodiversity around your premises. And again, it's these little things. If you've got 10 businesses on a high street, all of them with two or three pot plants out the front, this is going to do things to the natural environment on a wider scale. And I think this is where it is quite important to feed into that. Um, from my point of view, those rural pubs, you, again, you're looking low maintenance is, is certainly sort of key because you are stretched for time. Um, but I think it's a good draw for your guests to know that you're focusing on these things and that you have a biodiverse garden. It's not just a garden to be pretty. I can now shout about this. There's a reason for the plants that we've chosen. Um, and this is where we get towards one of the, the big things here, which is this idea of consumer choice you have to we've got some really bad consumer habits i think that have become ingrained over the last 10 years and i, I feel quite strongly about this this idea of one click ordering it turns up tomorrow and one stop shopping you get it all from the same place 
as businesses, we have to start trying to affect that wider consumer behavior change that allows you to use smaller suppliers that are more focused with their eco credentials, more focused on how they fit within the wider ecosystem of the planet as a whole. For instance, James, you said, you know, the ways that you're managing your hedgerows and the ways you manage your fields. We need to be making ethical choices in supply as a business. And that's the first step. Once you do that and you tell your consumers that you're doing that, you've now taken a large bit of work off their plate in breaking these bad habits. You really have. I, th I think you've taken a huge bit of work because if you allow the consumer to make easy ethical choices, then we can have this long tail effect building. While it's still difficult for a consumer to do more than they can, honestly, as I say, it's really, really difficult. You go to a high street, six small retailers to support, all oh, maybe some local meat, some local veg here. You've still got to visit six shops. And every now and again, you're just going to scratch your head and go, no, I don't really have time. So I'm just actually going to nip into the supermarket with a whole bunch of stuff that's been imported from miles and miles and miles away. Uh, no. So to break these habits as a, as a catering business, as a restaurant operation, you can start spreading that message by doing it yourself. Manage these long supplier lists, work up the supplier relationships and make the consumer choice easy because guests are educated. Everyone wants to do it. I think if you ask most people... He froze. That's fine. Systems we have. Um, I, I think they'd all agree. <laughs> we would. So let's let's make it easy. Oh, I can see I'm going a little unstable. You did. You, you froze. So whilst you restabilize, I'm going to launch your first poll, which I think really addresses this question. So how likely would you be to change suppliers based on their eco credentials? If you just want to take a couple of seconds to answer. And be as honest as you need to be again, because it's all about these little steps and we need to work together to be able to create this, this positive behavior in all of us, right? We are all guilty of that. Yes, and I've noticed there that you've put, uh, depends on price, yes, in one of the options. This is true. Uh, what I'm quickly finding is that when you've helped make the ethical choice um, and taken that sort of bit of work out of a guest's hand, people are quite happy to pay that little bit more for this peace of mind and the security. And it's lovely to see, very likely, brilliant. And I, and I think it's important. I think more businesses where they have even the smallest of environmentally positive credentials and, and, and planet positive credentials to, to really shout about it. Um, it's, it's very important to let people know. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I think our guests are educated. I think as businesses, we can help people make that choice easier. Um, and in short, it's just those small behavioral changes in the way a small business operates that all adds up. Maybe steps on the road to more sustainable practice in business and more strength to it, which is why I love working with you guys at Avalon, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I have another question from you, which I'm gonna launch. So is sustainability, biodiversity and green business practices something you've discussed or planned for? Um, and again, you know, none of us have the perfect solution. It's something we talk about a lot with Tim and Avalon. We're just doing the best that we can and we're learning as we go and we're transparent about what we're doing. And if anyone has you know, a better solution. We are so open to these conversations. Um, fantastic, thank you for answering. Merlin, how, how are things looking for your reopening? Uh, nobody knows, do you? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you plan for the worst and hope for the best. So there we go. Um, uh, yeah, Finger, fingers crossed we could, we could open sometime towards the beginning of July, should everything be the way it should be. Um, but if not, you plan for not. <laughs> So, well, we, there's no other way but to be positive, right? Yeah. Um, this is, so this is an interesting is, answer, actually, because yeah. people have actually planned for it. Because like you said, we all have conversations around it. But have you actually sat down and made concrete plans? And I'm very happy to see that people have sort of actually planned this into their business thinking or, or consumer thinking. This is great. That, that's really good news. Absolutely. And you, you can get, uh, we've gone, uh, mostly because we're a conservation charity, we've gone for specific accredit accreditation through Planet Mark. So there's lots of different accreditation schemes for um, sustainability and biodiversity and Planet Mark was the one that we went with, which um, 
it, it's quite hard work auditing your business uh, or charity in my case. Um, that's once the hard work is done, then you can start where we are now, then you can get ideas about how you can uh, improve the situation. But have it, it's quite expensive. I think it's about three and a half grand to uh, for our audit for our small charity. Um, but I, we thought it was money well spent uh, because it's simple things like, you know, we, we were saying to Planet Marker, well, we use recycled paper. And they said, well, did you know that actually it's better to use FCS paper uh, yeah. from sustainable sources rather than recycled paper? And it, it's just little things like that that we had no idea about. So. It's a total landfill, to be honest. It's really difficult because it's never a zero sum equation, which is what we've learned. And sustainability is multifaceted. And there are so many elements that interplay. And it could be anything from the kilometers to you know water usage or CO2 emissions. And there never is one right answer. So it's just about doing the best we can, and again, sharing these practices together. And there's a comment in the chat from uh, James Fowler, who was one of our panelists on Earth Day and runs um, you know, a few venues in the South of England, which are all sustainably focused. And I love his point. He's saying bars can promote a lifestyle and um, we forget that, but, but absolutely bars, restaurants, bartenders, chefs, they can be influential at global scale, but definitely in their local communities. And so, his point is if Nando's actually had a local menu option, even if it was a touch more expensive, people might actually go for it. Uh, you know, I think he's right. Um, yeah, I, I would tend to agree completely. Um, you're, you're, giving, you're giving your guests a reason to actually be with you beyond the obvious, you know, and, and I think that will make you stand out from your competition, which feeds directly into what this is about, banking on biodiversity. You know, this is how as a business you bank on it. Love, love it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Merlin, for your wise words. Um, now over to, to number one, Workerby. Um, how, how are things going at the Dalston Curve? How's planting? Thankfully, they've just stopped water uh, pressure washing, so things have got a lot quieter. <laughs> uh, so you, you won't hear some pressure washing in the background, hopefully. Um, things are beautiful. It's a gorgeous day here in Dalston. Oh, uh, now they've just started pressure washing again. So no I apologize if you can hear that. <laughs> it creates the nature effect. Yeah, no, so we're just here planting the rest of the, um, the plants that were destined to be at the RHS Malvern um, a couple of weeks ago to celebrate the 75th anniversary of VE Day and a very special woman called Violette Zasbo, who was a special operations executive um, during the Second World War and parachuted into Normandy behind German lines to support the French resistance, uh, a truly incredible woman. So it's really been amazing for us to be able to keep elements of that garden alive, um, create a special memorial garden at Merlin's Pub um, up in, in Badby and also bring some of those plants to a very special garden here in East London um, to help support the bees and also provide a green space for the local community, which I think is really important. So I'm going to talk about um, how we can bring biodiversity back into spirits. We've had some great talks from Jill about the bees, from James about bringing biodiversity into the back bar, about Merlin, about the, the kind of the, the marginal gains that small businesses can do to improve biodiversity. But I want to kind of have a look at the production um, of spirits and look at how they impact biodiversity and what we can do to either if we are spirits producers, I know we've got some on the call that work for some some brands, or whether we're a consumer and we're choosing, sorry, citizen, we've, Jarvis told us off last time for not to use the word consumer, but we must use the word citizen. Um, how citizens can choose uh, better, better products of biodiversity. And I've broken it down into three things. So we're gonna look at first raw materials because the environmental impact of any product starts with the raw materials that it's made from. Um, and James mentioned that, that farmers are almost always at the start of, start of that journey. And it's the choice of raw materials. Um, so whether you are a grain product, uh, uh, an agave product from Mexico, sugar cane, whether you're made from apples, from grapes, all of those products will have an environmental impact and of differing levels. Um, so many of the, as, as James mentioned, a lot of the, the alcohol that we, make, that we consume is made from uh, grain. And that grain is grown in a monocrop. 
similar to, to sugarcane, which is again, large areas of land growing a single um, crop. And that has lost, has meant the loss of biodiversity as um, Jill mentioned, you know, a 98% loss in, in uh, wildflower meadows since the 1930s. You know, we have lost a huge amount of our natural area and replaced it with modern monocrop agriculture, which has done away with, with that. And that's the biggest loss to um, our biodiversity. So grain, sugarcane, uh, agave to some extent, um, particularly with the growth of tequila and mezcal around the world. We are seeing in Mexico large swathes of traditional forest being torn down um, and being replaced with uh, agave fields. Again, and you've also got there the, the non-biodiversity and the fact that tequila is more made from the single, a single varietal of agave. Um, in Scotland, all single malt scotch is grown from the same variety of barley. You know, so you've got almost like, there's zero, almost zero biodiversity in the production of a large number of our spirits. Um, you go down to to brandy, and you might get a few different types of you know, three or four different varieties of grapes being used to make the brandies. Um, and we're also quite lucky with with apples. Um, because apples are grown in, uh, at least the apples that are used to make Calvados um, and a lot of the apple spirits are grown in extremely biodiverse, rich um, habitats. They are not natural habitats. Uh, we'll admit that, you know, the orchards are a man-made habitat. It's a man-made kind of artificial forest, um, but the rules and regulations that protect them uh, mean that we encourage a large amount of biodiversity in those very traditional farms. Now, I'm not expecting that everyone should go out and, and start making spirits from apples because that is also is not biodiverse because then we'll just end up with one type of spirit. But there are some practices that we can encourage, um, and I'm sure that James knows a lot more about this, to support biodiversity within current agricultural product uh, processes. So I've been really inspired by you know, small brands like Chase um, that have the ability to do this, but also seeing the response by some of the much larger players um, like Perno Ricard, for example, who have put biodiversity front and center. So one of their four key core pillars is um, restorative or nurturing agriculture. So not just about monoculture, which takes from the land, and then you have to rely upon um, artificial pesticides and fertilizers to be able to grow your plants, but replenishing the land, replenishing the soil so that it can provide the nutrients, it can provide biodiversity. And some of the things you would do there is uh, the restoration of hedgerows. As James mentioned, hedgerows are an incredibly rich source of biodiversity and very traditional, particularly um, in the UK, you know, the UK is famed for its hedgerows, but over the last 20 or 30 years, we have seen farms get bigger and bigger, fields get bigger and bigger as modern equipment has become more efficient. And we've seen hedgerows slowly disappear. Um, so the restoration of hedgerows, um, wildflower areas within the farms as well. So you know, having areas of your land that is dedicated to wildflowers and also having areas of land um, that are allowed to rewild. Uh, for those of you that don't know, rewilding is uh, a process where you naturally let the land um, take its course with very minimal land management. There's generally some sort of land management involved, but reducing that land management to its lowest possible um, uh, amount so that, the, that nature can take its own path. Nature is incredible at the speed in which uh, it restores itself. And I think we've seen a little bit that, of that over the lockdown. You know, if you give nature the space uh, to, to restore itself, it will do it incredibly quickly. So rewilding, installing wildflower meadows into your, your kind of large fields or your monoculture practice, and also the restoration of hedgerows, I think are three steps that all produce farmers and producers could take. And if you're a producer that knows that doesn't have your own farm like Chase and you're purchasing from there, have those conversations with your farmers um, because it benefits everyone in the long term. Second part I wanna talk about is natural capital. 
and natural capital is the value uh, that nature provides that, uh, for our economy and for allowing us to do business every day. Um, and it's incredibly value, you know, the economy does not just rely on the things that we buy and we sell. Nature provides a huge amount. I mean, Jill mentioned the just the sheer value of um, the bees providing pollination. It's like 680 million pounds a year. It's the value that bees give to our economy. And that is a natural capital. And there's many, many forms of natural capitals. So if you are a producer and a distiller, you have this opportunity to um, increase the natural capital of your of your production facility you know natural capital by installing wildflowers by installing trees to capture um, you know co2 helps manage water resources so you're reducing your risk of flooding you can use natural capital for filtration uh, it's also uh, pollution reduction there's been some great um, examples in india of uh, manufa you know, industrial manufacturers using natural capital to reduce the, the pollution levels in and around their facilities, which has then led to an increased health in their staff and reduced costs um, in sick leave and lost productivity. So there's a huge financial opportunity as well for increasing um, biodiversity. You can plant flowers for bees, as we've been talking about bees all day, um, and it is World Bee Day. Um, and another great thing that you could do is install a pond. Um, if you have a distillery, if you have a piece of land that, that your company manages, if you, if you have a bar with a, you know, like at Merlin's place where there is a garden, installing a pond of any size, like a small frog pond to a much larger pond with fish in it, is one of the single most impactful things you can do to improve the biodiversity of the land. Um, so looking at how you can improve the natural capital of your of your um, property or your facility, I think can be can be hugely important. And that goes for, for the smallest bar, like installing some flowers in your bar or um, growing some herbs. And at Merlin's pub, um, he's growing, gets like kilos of strawberries. There's uh, mint growing, apples, rhubarb. There's like a forest of sage. You know, all of this stuff provides biodiversity and also provides a source of ingredients for his uh, kitchen and his bar. So that's another fantastic way that no matter what the size of your business, you can incorporate um, biodiversity into that. And then finally, it's about the product. So how, you know, once you've got, got your liquid, um, how can you improve the, the biodiversity of your product? And it comes down to trying to use natural ingredients. So one thing that uh, that we really advocate, and I know that um, when we were at the Green Awards, which are hosted by the drinks business, the, the head of the drinks business repeatedly would talk about the importance of using cork, like real cork, uh, because the cork forests in, in Portugal um, and Spain are one of the most biodiverse rich areas anywhere in the world. And so by using natural cork as opposed to synthetic plastic corks, which are made from uh, fossil fuels, you're actually helping support financially those beautiful forests and that super rich biodiverse area. Um, so natural corks over plastic is a fantastic way that, and a very, very simple way for no extra cost that you can support biodiversity. Um, and then you can also look at your POS. So you can bring in options like seed packs. So there are some great brands out there now providing wildflower seeds uh, for, for customers. So Warner's Gin um, is a great brand that, that I work with, with Healthy Hospo, who do that. Uh, Portobello Gin have also started doing it. Um, obviously with Avalen, we have our seed bombs, but this is a great way that we can encourage uh, people to grow flowers at home and reconnect with nature. You know, As we've become a more urban species, a big problem that we have is that we've become a little bit disconnected from nature, from the insects, from the plants, because we spend 90% of our time indoors. Um, so if we can bring a little bit of, of nature back into people's lives, they'll start to reconnect with the wonder of plants, the wonder of insects and birds. 
Um, and for me, one of it's been one of the super positive things that I've seen during the lockdown is people reconnecting with growing uh, food at home and plants. Okay. In the UK, we had uh, the government for some reason has shut everything, but allowed garden centres to reopen um, last week. So I went out at the weekend. There's a garden centre near me. And I went past at 11 o'clock in the morning and the queue was down the road to get into the garden. There must have been like 40 people in the queue to get it. It's a very British thing. Yeah? British people are probably quite enjoying lockdown because it means you have to queue for everything now. But you had this queue of 40 people down the road to get to a garden centre. And then I rode past again at 5.30 in the evening and the queue was just as long. So I think one of the things that has happened here is people have kind of reconnected with growing um, plants again at home, which I think is fantastic. So there's all sorts of options that we can do to bring biodiversity back into spirits production, you know, and move away from this uh, world of hyper cheap, neutral grain spirit produced um, alcohol and start to replenish nature, that restorative farming practices um, and really give a little bit back so that when we are drinking, we're drinking for, for good. Um, you know, and we're having a positive impact upon the planet through the choices that we, we have. Now, Steph, you have a little poll I do. for me as well. Are you ready to go? Yep. And I think just building on that point, Tim, what's so interesting and going back to something Philip Duff said, I think a few weeks back, um, you know, we're, we're at a time whereby the cost of bottle and dry goods seems to be higher than the cost of the liquids in the mm -hmm. bottle. And going back and looking at actually using these different types of raw materials, I can assure you, and I'm sure it's similar for Chase, our cost of liquid is actually higher than our cost of dry goods. And that's something we're very proud of. Yep, uh, super cheap bottle, but it's super expensive liquid. So my question is how many different habitats are there in a traditional uh, apple orchard? One, two, or three. Okay, take a few seconds. And then we will be um, taking some of your questions. I already have one lined up from James. Okay, all right, ending poll. Here we go, Tim, what do you think? They got it right? I hope so, yes. Um, so apple orchards are known as a mosaic habitat because they contain multiple different um, habitats within uh, one area. So within an apple orchard, you have uh, the forest. Um, it is an artificial forest, but interestingly in Normandy, you, in a traditional single orchard, you will have up to 10 different species of apples. So every single row of apple tree uh, is a different species. So they never plant two identical rows next to each other. And then quite often you'll also have pear trees around the outside. Um, you also have the hedgerows. So the apple orchards tend to be very small fields in comparison to something like a cornfield. Um, so you've got the hedgerows around the outside, which are also super rich, uh, biodiverse habitat. And then in between the trees and, um, and the hedgerows, you have a meadow. So in Normandy, it's illegal to cut the grass um, during the growing season. So you get the grass and the flowers in the meadow growing as well. So an apple orchard in Normandy is actually three separate habitats all within a single orchard. So it's a super, super rich biodiverse area. Amazing. And I am very much looking forward to going again. Oh, me when too. When France opened their borders. <laughs> and you're all invited, everyone on the call, you're all invited to come to Normandy with us. Everyone is still on the call. Everyone, everyone is. It's a reward for staying this long and listening to me. Talk. I'm writing a list of all the invitations. <laughs> I've Dinner got. James is. All the speakers, yeah, all the attendees. The over to the pub. Uh, yeah. And then over to Normandy. Sounds fantastic, fantastic. right? You've sorted out your summer. And we've even got a chateau summer, where we can have a party. So, <laughs> so just to, to kind of conclude, um, and, and firstly, thank you to, to all the speakers for sharing their uh, nuggets of wisdom with us. Um, I do have a question in again from, from James. He's very curious today, James. Um, so catering for bees, this is a Jill question. What's the hardy plants that are the heroes for those wanting to pot easily outside of front venues? Oh, uh, well, lavenders for one. 
the most perfect, really high quality pollen and nectar. Very easy to maintain, always looks nice when you're outside offices or anything. Uh, Hebes, likewise, really easy to maintain um, uh, and they go on. Um, things like uh, a bit, bit, bit messier really is comfrey is such a good early plant. The thing is about planting is to have something that's flowering uh, throughout the flight season of the, of the bees, which is usually from March through to October. So if you think of all your spring bulbs of your crocus and your daffodils and things, nice open flowers that they can get in, those are really good and they look nice in spring. Uh, along with snowdrops and stuff. Uh, and then when you come into the summer, you, you've got uh, your hellebores uh, or, or your spring, your hellebores and your, your herbs are really good. You know, for a pub to have a huge, great herb bed outside. Uh, rosemary usually flowers for oh. months and months and months. Brilliant for and that. And it's impossible well. to kill. Yeah, it is impossible to kill. It's quite a thug, but really brilliant. And, you know, thyme, that, that thyme, which with the, has the tiny, tiny flower, brilliant pollinators but really high you wouldn't believe how high the concentration is at so i think things like uh, things like that uh, ordinary natural flowers not not bedding plants if you go and buy anything like a begonia or um, a busy lizzie or those winter pansies they're they're grown they're over hybridized they're, they're hybridized for their color and they actually have no pollen or nectar in them at really? all. No, wow. useless, absolutely useless for any insect. Yeah. The thing to do is to spend, oh, this is what my I do, drive Steve mad, is to drive about an hour at a garden centre just wandering around and looking where the bees are feeding <laughs> <laughs> and buy that plant. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's also a great, I mean, I've been to Merlin's uh, pub and there's some great opportunities there to, to harvest seasonal ingredients as well. It's got, it's got a massive strawberry patch. Um, how many kilos of strawberries to get off there, Merlin? Well, I mean, I think this year I should get somewhere between 25 and 30 kilos to come off that. We'll get, we'll get at least two, we'll get at least two, if not three crops off there. Last year we got four. You know, and that's just in an in a industry that operates on such tiny margins. That's, that's free profit, right? You can take those strawberries make some delicious drinks. Um, well, yeah, it's huge. Um, you, you, you're right, you process, you process them down. That's the thing, you know, you've got the fresh load that goes out instantly, but if there's stuff that you can't use within your standard sort of three to five day shelf life of, uh, of items like that, yeah, I'm making purees, freezing them, compots, freezing them, syrups, keeping them chilled. If you do a proper sterilized syrup preparation, that's why I get sick, you'll get six to 12 months off that properly made. Mm. It's, it's great. And they taste so much better than store, store brought strawberries. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the big one is citrus is the only one in this country, I think, to, to, to have a look at. Um, it's, it's very difficult. You rely upon some kind of sourness. There. Yeah, well, uh, climate apples, change. Though, apples, I believe, are going to be our friend there. Um, it's, it's James knows lots about ACVs. Um, I think are possibly the future there. And ultimately, you know, we're not saying end all form of global exchange of any ingredient. It's just about reducing and then being far more aware and conscientious of when we are using these incredibly fantastic exotic products and, and paying the right price for them. Uh, I miss seasonality. I just, I really miss eating things when they're in season and when they're delicious and then not having them and missing them for a year and then having them again, you know, it's the silliest thing, but. I think that that's, that's a really interesting point there on, I think we've been cut, we've become so um, uh, spoiled with having anything that we want, you know, any time of day, any time of year. And it wasn't so long ago you know, I talked to my parents and their grandparents, my grandparents, and uh, 20, 30 years ago, the thought of having a kiwi uh, yeah. at Christmas was incredible. But now a kiwi is, can be bought at your local news agent on a high street, which is just incredible. So I think um, we've all become very spoiled. And I think maybe through what we're going now, will we revert back to actually cherishing things and, and okay. paying the, the right price for things. But, um, yeah. and that's, that comes with spirits because, you know, I love, I think the true form of, of being sustainable is is how diverse you are and it's really fun being diverse um it might give you quite a bad hangover the next day but um oh, but, but it's you. great to there, there's there's actually, grain, grain. i can't i don't believe that there's actually no real evidence in that um all alcohol <laughs> molecules are the same um uh, of the old wiles tale though yeah i'm sticking to my ambriel sparkling wine which i just think is delicious and and avalon obviously 
Oh, oh, of course, yes. I, I know. <laughs> so I have got a bottle in my in my drinks cabinet. <laughs> Lovely. Well, listen, we're in time, so I think um, again a big round of applause to you all. Happy World Bee Day, everybody. Um, not not the usual sort of day that you have on a on a drinks calendar, but um, I think this has shown us why it's really important um, to have these conversations. So we will be publishing this on our YouTube channel, and then we will be writing up a report with the fantastic Yael Weisberg, who's also on our call, who'll be help, helping us write, write our second edition of our Positively Charged um, series. And so we'll be sharing that with everyone as well. So don't forget to order your bee bombs and all that's left to say from us, Tim. Well, is... Hang on, one second, one second. Uh, and also a little advert for next month's uh, webinar. So we've decided off the back of um, the last one being so popular that we're going to try and do these every single month. So June, we're going to look at uh, the impact of packaging within the industry. Um, so we're lining up some really fantastic speakers to see the impact of packaging and what innovation is going on to make packaging uh, more sustainable and have a smaller impact upon the environment. So sometime in June, we haven't fixed a date, we will be talking about the sexy world of packaging. So on that note, okay. thanks again. And Tim, I'm gonna let you do it. Yeah. Only thing we have left to say is- Remember, remember to be, to be positive. positive. <laughs> Right. Thank we'll you very much, everyone. Off now. Well. Yeah, buzz off and enjoy the rest of World Bee Day. <laughs> Bye. Good Thank night. you. Miss. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> right. End meeting.